but what's really important is I think is just having really clear objectives like setting out from the start what do we want to achieve with that particular event is our focus just on bringing in as much money as possible is the focus building relationships is it both of those at the same time and it's really making the most of having those opportunities to talk about the realities of our work face to face with people so uh, that they can really understand and engage with us as like representatives of the charity as well um and it's really understanding as well that that the different contexts that events throw up like I said like a comedy night compared to a formalized panel event they're very different audiences so it's really important that you kind of adapt your messaging accordingly to that and then apply it so then that people really resonating as much as possible Hello and welcome to On The Same Landing Page, episode 18. Um, as always, I am Astra, Head of Advertising at Web Presence. I'm here with my co-host, Jason. Hello. Hello. Uh, and in this rendition of the podcast, we are fortunate enough to be joined by Heather Moss, who is the Public Fundraising Manager at Bloody Good Period. Hello, Heather. Thanks for joining us. Hi, it's great to be here. <laughs> nice to have you. Um, I'm going to dive straight into our first section because there's a lot we want to talk about on this, but... Um, if the name didn't give away what your charity does, can you just give us a brief a brief overview of the mission of Bloody Good Period? Yeah, of course. So BGP was founded by Gabby Edlin in 2016 um, when she found out the very few food banks and asylum seeker drop-in centres were providing period products, despite the really obvious need for period products to be provided. Um, and so she su sex successfully developed BGP from a Facebook whip around um, for products to the charity that we are today. So essentially, we get period products um, and menstrual health supplies to refugees, asylum seekers, and those less likely to be able to afford or access them. And we also provide menstrual, sexual and reproductive health sessions led by medical professionals to refugees and asylum seekers. I mean, that's a brilliant uh, Facebook <laughs> testimonial, isn't it? Just a quick whip round and an amazing like, show of force from people who are obviously also passionate about this. So you guys started as um, kind of like welfare bags, I suppose, is, is kind of where you came from. But as you kind of touched on there, you are much more than that now. And you do lots of education as well. Like, so obviously a lot of the products go to asylum seekers, refugees, that kind of thing. How important is it in to introduce them to education as well? Because... I know when we spoke before, you said they don't often know sort of how to use a tampon and stuff like that. So it's no good kind of giving them the resources. Can you just talk a little bit about the link between education and resources in Bloody Good Period? Yeah, of course. I mean, we started providing education sessions after several of our partners um, said that um, the people they support were asking questions about menstrual sex and reproductive health that they simply didn't have the answers to there. Um, and then we did some research and found out how infrequently refugees and asylum seekers were actually having um, medical appointments for these issues. And so we set up the education programme in collaboration with our amazing partners, our medical volunteers, so that we could deliver these sessions um, and support menstruating asylum seekers and refugees to help them understand what was going on with their bodies and also mm -hmm. about sexual and reproductive health, because all of those are linked and it's really important that they are also able to have autonomy over their bodies and able to look after themselves and their flow. I like that. Yeah. Look, I was going to say your branding is so strong throughout bloody good period flow. I like it. Sorry Jason, go on. Yeah, and it's not just um, in that area. You're also helping like corporates and companies with the education of, around this subject. Is that right? Yes, so we recently, or about a year or so ago, we launched our Bloody Good Employers Program, which is an accreditation program run by our amazing um, employers manager, Alicia. Uh, so that is for companies to basically come to us and we run an accreditation program so that we can work out kind of exactly what needs to be improved in workplaces, because so many workplaces like they don't have menstrual products available in the workplace but it's also making sure that everyone has that education as well that not just 
the people who are menstruating, but everyone around them, their co-workers, their managers, so that everyone can be supported in the workplace or at home, wherever they are, that everyone has the knowledge to be able to look after themselves and be able to support their team as best they can. Uh, yeah, I saw your bloody good employers uh, uh, posted before actually, and before coming on the podcast, sent it to our director. Like maybe <laughs> we should do this. Very good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, hmm. So, but no, that's a really cool, uh, really cool resource. Um, and you guys obviously have bloody good employers. You're called bloody good. Period. Not to dive headfirst into like the marketing side of things, but how important is that branding for you guys? I mean, I know you you have like events that you've named bloody good stuff but I'll let you talk about those and um, can you talk about some of the examples of where you've used the branding how important it is and then maybe your next your latest event because I know you guys are eager to chat about that I mean our branding is just so important to us um we always wanted to be a trailblazing charity and we think that you can't talk about periods without being completely bold about it being unapologetic being apologetic about periods and whispering about them is where we got to this position in the first place yeah. of not being able to talk about them using things like oh just using euphemisms instead of just talking about it's a period I'm having my period so it's really important to us that we're very bold in that brand because part of our mission is making sure that we're putting an end to shame and stigma and really mm -hmm. dispelling these myths about periods so it's really important that we maintain that throughout our messaging that we have a really consistent tone and that people genuinely engage with us because they love how bold we are about what we do mm -hmm. and that we really care about what we do yeah I can um, say it harks back to kind of like tampax using blue liquid in their adverts instead exactly. of like just showing something that look, actually looks like blood um but yeah can you I mean you guys probably know off the top of your head better than I do but what are some of the examples we've obviously given bloody good period I've seen things about like sustainable flow, that kind of thing. What are some of your like favorite little tidbits? Um, on the oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I think whenever it comes to like, I think we just love slipping in bloody as much as we possibly yeah. can. Like you mentioned events and like our most recent event coming up, I think is 12th of September. We've got our annual comedy night, which is bloody funny. And it's just all of those as little tips. It's not just a comedy night. It's bloody funny because we're talking yeah. about periods and that's what we hear and we care about. But we can still have a good laugh with it. It's about being really like free to be able to kind of laugh and have a good time talking about this. We're also acknowledging that it's a really serious topic to talk about. So and I don't feel like normalization can really come about if you can't even like just joke about it and just be like, I'm, I'm on my period. Like, yeah, let's laugh. There's something Love. so like quintessentially British about it as well, like oh bloody period. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Even it even comes across like in the tone of voice. I was looking through the website, um, and you've got the way that you explore these like quite crucial topics is even done with some humor, and it really like engages you. Um, there's like a piece to think like how do you, how do I support you? And it says cold hard cash, honey, <laughs> is yeah. the answer. Um, and there's like. Why don't you accept physical product donations anymore? Because we've changed our way of working, babes. Like it's such a brilliant way of a fresh way to talk about this stuff. And it keeps people interested and will learn more as a result. Love it. I think that's a really great point. Actually, we recently received an email from a 70, a man in his 70s, literally emailing us saying that he found being called babe immensely pleasing. And it really <laughs> shows how much our brand resonates with everyone it's not just people who menstruate it's so much wider than that and it really goes beyond just like a specific age bracket it's really we are for everyone and I just I really love that I just I love that email I think it's on our like socials now I think we made an Instagram post about it and everyone was just like Dave the babe in the comments <laughs> it was amazing <laughs> oh bless Dave shout out to Dave <laughs> 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 to touch on them your Instagram, which is incredible. I really urge our listeners to go and have a look at it. Again, the theme is super strong. Um, obviously, you guys started as a Facebook whip around, if you like. How important is social media in sort of achieving your mission, spreading the word? I mean, social media is just vital to us and getting our messaging out. Like you said, that's where we started. But I think that's where a lot of people engage with news now. People aren't necessarily mm -hmm. like sitting down and watching like a broadcast at the start of the day. They're getting their news from their Twitter feeds or scrolling through Instagram. 
And we're also in the age of influencers as well, mm -hmm. where really all of that information is coming a lot from people that just individuals that they care about. So for us, it's really important making sure that we are in these spaces as well. And I feel like our tone fits in really nicely with those spaces as well, but we also really stand out with the brand that we have. It, and it's really a great place to just have these conversations. If we post a testimonial or a story, we have people in our comment section that are saying about their own experiences or how they're really bloody angry about the same <laughs> issues that we're angry about. And it kind of snowballs from there because then they'll share that post on their story and someone else will engage with it that way. And it really just snowballs and just gets bigger and bigger, which is amazing for us. Oh, no, it's, it's really good. It's one of the best charity Instagrams I've seen in a long time. But obviously, aside from doing the like comical website copy, the bloody funny comedy nights, you guys do like really serious um, lobbying for legislation change as well. Can you just talk a little bit about um, your most recent lobbying? Yes. So we've just launched our period penalty campaign that went live on Menstrual Health Day, which is the 28th of May. And we were actually at Parliament this week um, for oh, an wow. MP drop in, which was amazing. We had really strong engagement. So we're really making sure that we are doing all we can to make changes. Like we know that Scotland has now been the first country in the world to legalise um free period products for everyone who menstruates and so we really want to follow that we want to be next in line so that's one of our key um policies that we want to lobby for we want free period products for everyone in England and Wales uh, we really think that that should be paired with a campaign to let everyone know how to access these products because a lot of the time people don't know how to get to them so it's really important that they know that as well um, so we really want stronger legal policies. We would like this to be enforced by local councils to give the free period products and then the government help support through funding. And we also would really love some national rules and guidelines, guidance on how to help with menstrual and menopausal health. And this can be really for public places like in schools, in temporary accommodation and even in businesses like our bloody employers programme. So making sure everyone is supported who menstruates in every aspect of society so there's i mean there's a, there's a really good summary of what the problems are in the uk um and that's is that is that what you think has caused this like period poverty because we shouldn't be in this position right if scotland can seem seemingly make steps in the right direction why are we still in a position where this is so overlooked in so many places what's your kind of personal opinion on it all what do you think needs to be addressed first of all of those that huge that huge task i mean it does feel very overwhelming it does feel like there's a lot to be done but we've got to start somewhere and the start of that is just making sure that we have free period products available we know right now that everyone has so many demands on their finances we're stretched too thinly minimum wage is not rising with the cost of inflation going up we had the pandemic that made a tough situation even worse a lot of people lost their jobs or they were on furlough so they wasn't having the same income that they were before and then on top of that we now have the cost of living crisis so people are just being stretched so thinly and they're having to make some really really tough decisions whether oh do i put food on the table tonight or do i buy the period products that i need and sometimes people have more complicated um, periods where they need more products or they need more painkillers. And so there's all those additional costs as well that kind of build up and it's it's every month. Yeah. So and that really does build up over time. So I think it needs to begin with making sure that we have the products available for everyone and then following that with education. So everyone actually understands this issue from the start and not just for everyone who menstruates, but just everyone in total needs to know about this because I'm sure even if you don't have a period yourself you know someone that does your mum mm -hmm. your sister your colleague your friend there is someone in your life that you know that is going through this too yeah exactly it's so it is just it's so bizarre how we how we make up over half of the population now I think menstruators and um I think so <laughs> yeah but, yeah but we don't get any of the sort of representation um which is insane. But there you go. Um, how do you encourage people to get involved? So obviously, it's cold hard for cash, babe, um, from Dave. Obviously, you can't accept donations of um, sort of like tampons, pads. How can like the every person get involved um, with what you guys do? I mean, literally just sharing our messaging as far and mm -hmm. wide as much as possible. Get sharing our stories on 
socials, get putting them on Facebook, Instagram, bring them into the workplace. If you can't donate to us necessarily yourself, organize a fundraiser at your place of work with your friends, look coffee morning, have a little complain at the same time. It's <laughs> always good fun, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um if you're able to like come to our events coming up that would be amazing our early bird tickets are available for our fundraising um our comedy night at the moment so it's a little plug there That's okay. <laughs> um yeah and also you can write to your mps if you're available to do that we have a template on our website under the period penalty tab uh, so you can just copy and paste that and send that right over to really make sure that we are spreading this messaging as far and wide as possible yeah, I think that's so great as well. You guys are about like inclusion and diversity and everything. And so much so that you even have a template that someone can just sort of like sign into their MP. I think that it's the little things like that that really make people feel like welcome on the site, if you like. So really enjoy that. And um, can you talk to us about your bloody strategy? Uh, amazing <laughs> bloody strategy. So, I mean, it's as simple as basically what we've gone through already of what we're kind of mm -hmm. lobbying for with the period penalty. So we want product provision. We want education mm -hmm. and we want to keep campaigning to make sure that happens because you cannot have the provisional products without accurate and inclusive education about menstruation, contraception and sexual and reproductive health. They all go together hand in hand and like the shame and stigma and the myths run deep. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be dispelled without meaningful education. It's all well and good handing people free products and saying, right, off you go. But some people don't even know how to use them. I remember the first time I was handed a tampon and I was like, what on earth do I do with that? <laughs> <laughs> so it's really important that we pair that with education so people know what's happening to their bodies necessarily before it happens. Mm -hmm. And also educating people around them of what's going on. It's just really important that all of those come together. We need lasting change. And that is how we do it. How does that, um, how have you kind of used, you've got some great ambassadors as well to kind of like further the message. Um, my knowledge of how ambassadors come into play for charities is very small. Can you help me uh, understand what kind of role they play in the charity's goals and objectives? Yeah, I mean, ambassadors are important for a number of reasons. Like I said, we live in the age of influencers. Mm -hmm. So being able to have people like celebrities, actors, all different people from different walks of life, being able to shout about our messaging is really, really important to get our message to a wider audience. People that wouldn't necessarily engage with us directly without seeing it on someone else's story or seeing them taking part in an event. Um, mentioning events, we also have amazing ambassadors that do organise events for us. Bloody Funny, our comedy night was organised by Jen Brister, who brings all the talent together for us. We probably wouldn't know where to start without Jen bringing in amazing comedians for us. So that's great. And then we have um, Clara Ampho, amazing Radio 1 DJ. Um, who organised our Bloody Good Music event. It was the first one of its kind last year. It was incredible. Um, I couldn't be there, which I was so upset oh, no. about. Um, but it's those kind of events that are really amazing. It's very different types of events as well. So really making sure that we are open and everyone can engage with us because not everyone wants to attend a very serious sit-down panel event. Mm -hmm. Like they can be quite heavy. Not everyone wants to engage with our message in that way. But if you have a comedy night or a music night where you still have our messaging laced throughout that, it can be really, really tangible, the difference that that makes. So ambassadors are really important for spreading that message. We also have amazing Kenny, who is a trans man. And so that's really important to us as well to acknowledge that not everyone who menstruates is a woman or identifies as a woman. So it's really mm -hmm. important for us to be as inclusive as possible. So to have people like Kenny also standing with us and being our ambassadors is just really incredible for us. Now I've got some ideas as to why you've managed to get this incredible reach and so many fantastic people on board. Um, and it links to probably your messaging and the way you stand out. But how do you, you know, if you're, if you've got a new cha new charity, you've got, you're really passionate about it. How does someone get these massive names involved? Like, is it a snowball effect? Does it take a lot of time? What went into that to make these great events? Because I've seen, I've seen them. I haven't been to one, but I've seen them and they look fantastic. What's, I mean, there's a lot of work, I'm sure, but 
Can you tell us yeah. some of the wins <laughs> or some of the strategy that kind of makes that happen? I mean, you're right. It's a lot of time and a lot of emails, a lot of the time, mm-hmm. a lot of back and forth for a long time. Um, but what's really important is I think is just having really clear objectives, like setting out from the start, what do we want to achieve with that particular event? Is our focus just on bringing in as much money as possible? Is the focus building relationships? Is it both of those at the same time? And it's really making the most of having those opportunities to talk about the realities of our work face to face with people. So uh, that they can really understand and engage with us as like representatives of the charity as well. Um, and it's really understanding as well that, that the different contexts that events throw up, like I said, like a comedy night compared to a formalized panel event, they're very different audiences. So it's really important that you kind of adapt your messaging accordingly to that and then apply it. So then that people really resonating as much as possible. Well, they, they look great. When's the next event before? Uh, 12th of September. Early bird tickets out now for Bloody Funny. We have an incredible lineup. I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> a big event in the calendar. Um, I know you guys do a few other kinds of partnerships. We'll kind of like wind this bit up now. But can you talk to us about some of your corporate partnerships and sort of how they play into your mission and why you need them? I mean, yeah, like corporate partnerships are amazing and they are so important for us like their endorsement means that our support increases much like with the ambassadors and reaching those wider audiences but it also means that we can work with other companies and businesses that align with our own beliefs and missions a lot of the time they come to us because they mm-hmm. our messaging really resonates with them and it's really great when we hear that they are trying to implement that stuff already like they're already trying to implement like free period products in their workplace and just really know that they resonate with what we have to say and that they really care and believe in our work. So that's really, really important for us. And what's Mm -hmm. really important as well, I think, is making sure that we work with large and small businesses and seeing the different ways that those relationships can play out. Sometimes it is just like donating a percentage of profits from certain sales. But sometimes it's literally like they come to us because they would like to run events. We recently worked with a smaller um, independent company called Nemi Tees who came to us because they really wanted to run an event for Refugee Week, which took place last week. And it was amazing. It was quite a small event, but there was really, really strong engagement, really good conversations Mm -hmm. happening about the real life experience for refugees right now. So it's having those different connections and really allowing those relationships to develop and blossom over time because it's not just about money or like that quick win of a donation. It is about really building relationships that last where you both resonate with each other's causes. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really important on this as well is that we do say no. Yeah, And I feel like a lot of um, people are surprised that as a charity we do we do say no they're like well you just want all the money like we would love all the money but mm-hmm. it's really important that we stick to our morals and our values like we had a vaping company come to us and <laughs> for us that's just it just doesn't align with the message no. we're putting out and a very large fast fast fashion brand came to us as well and like that could have generated a lot of income for us but it simply doesn't align with our values. Like how can we accept money from them who are using like cheap labor when we ourselves Mm -hmm. are campaigning against a specific aspect of poverty? Yeah, It just doesn't work. So it's really making sure that we have our clear values and our clear line of when we say yes and when we say no. I think that's it. If you you take all the money and then uh, a few years down the line, you're aligned with a fast fashion brand who doesn't give pre-period products to their workers or whatever you kind of your mission is over you lose all your credibility and so it it makes sense but also it's hard to turn away the hard cash babes so (laughs) So give us some more babes (laughs) (laughs) this is going to be my uh, my personality for the next few weeks now for sure (laughs) um well thank you very much I feel like I've learned a lot about some of the inner workings of what goes on at bloody good period um but now we're going to test how much you really know with our fake (laughs) fact section Um, I think these have been created from things on the website um, of Bloody Good Period. Jason also does not know, so we'll be playing along (laughs) with you. 
Um, I feel like I should have memorized a lot more of the website before this. <laughs> no, it's all a bit of fun. Nobody's going to get fired or anything like that. So, all good. Right, let me just pull this up, make this big. So, section two, fake facts. I feel like I need a jingle here, but we should have called it like bloody fake facts or something. But there you go. <laughs> so, the first fake fact, which of these three facts is fake? A, women spend on average seven years of their life on their period. B, being on your period changes how your voice sounds. C, the average age people start their period is 17. Which one is the faked fact? Oh my gosh, that's hard. <laughs> you know, scratches around. <laughs> seven years their life on their period oh like oh yeah she had all the time up right okay yeah uh, doesn't just like happen for seven years and then yeah i was maybe be better <laughs> yeah yeah Be on your period. my instinct is to say about the voice because i genuinely never heard that before but yeah i've never heard that either but then that makes me think that's what they like, this is there's so many tricks in the way that these are set but, up like yeah the but then thing, i also but... think that is it, the, is it the average age because I thought the average age was lower lower than that. Yeah, I'm going to go. <laughs> I, I'm just copying you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I can yeah, feel yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go with the third one is the fake facts for me. Same. <laughs> okay. Can you, before you go to the next slide, can you click view or present uh, or play? I think it is. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Top. I will do. Sorry. Just because I could see. I wasn't issues. looking, but I could I could see the results. Of the oh. Okay. Uh, oh, I so, didn't look. Uh, well, well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> the fake fact. Hey. Well, there it is. Yes. You looked. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> the average age people start their period is seven. Is not seventeen. It's actually twelve. Which I also didn't think it would be that low, but there you are. So next when do you start having conversations <laughs> with with people about that? Typically, when this might be a bit of a personal question, but. I have no, no idea about it. Um, I mean, as a charity, BGP only works with people over the age of 18. That's simply because of capacity. If we could work with everyone, we would. We get a lot of um, inquiries to work within schools, but we simply just do not have the capacity to do that. And it's really hard that we can't. Yeah. But I think it's just important to have these conversations as early as you feel that that person is mature enough to understand Mm -hmm. yeah. and but also definitely before it's happening so yeah. that you are prepared and that you understand it well that's the thing is it like that's the average so obviously there'll be like some below lots below that as well and when when I when I was asking that I was thinking like when do people come in your life to, to, uh, to tell you to prepare you for this is it normal for you to get a conversation from your maybe your mom or or, your, or someone like that at I that think. age or is I think mine happened when I was like in school, when I was in like mm. year five. So what would I have been about like nine, 10, um, about nine. And all I really, I don't, I don't remember very much. I don't feel like there was very much like comprehensive knowledge about periods and menstruation, what's actually happening to the body. All mm. I can really remember now, and it's been what, like almost 10 years, they just like put a, um, almost 20 years there we go I forgot how old I was then um I remember they got like a glass of water and just put a tampon in it and was yeah. like that's how a tampon works and I was like what but yeah because like practically... obviously because it was a big glass it got what does the water represent huge. I know I was like what <laughs> so it it was well it was I'm, I'm yeah, not going to say it was not, helpful. I don't want to say that was helpful to me. In no, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the out. fact that you're asking, like, it just shows one of the key issues with, like, particularly sex education in schools is that they separate out yep. the men and the women and then are like, you learn about different things, and which is mental, you know? Um, yeah. Well, yeah, like, I might have a daughter who doesn't have any, and no female family members that are close yeah. and I might need to tell her so I should know isn't it? yeah exactly but like just uh just a quick note on that same thing I remember my mum like having the birds and the bees chat with me and just being filled with shame and wanting the conversation to end I was like yeah. why are we talking about this what are we doing and that's exactly the response that you, you just don't want you know it's supernatural like it's as natural as blowing your nose kind of thing so 
shows how ingrained the generational trauma is. Anyway, yes. fake fact two. <laughs> um, 2.3 billion lacks basic sanitation services. Oh, I can't see the last word because I've made this big. One second. Well, let me just right. move, let me just uh, move you guys down a bit. Sorry. Technical issues. We're doing it live. We're doing it live. <laughs> Um, worldwide, yes, thank you, Jason. Twelve percent of people who have periods report their period pains are so severe that they have to miss work or school. And endometriosis affects one in ten women aged fifteen to forty-nine. What do we think? I'm gonna I'm gonna go first just because I robbed your answer, Heather, on the last one. Okay, <laughs> I, th I I think number three is correct. I think um, number two is i think the number's going to be quite different i think it's just slightly different the number and i think number one is probably actually i think one is the fake fact i think one is the fake fact yeah number okay. two one. wait you said one two I, i'm in Which between one fake? or two <laughs> one is fake i think one is fake one is fake heather what do you think oh tough um I know that the percentages are unfortunately higher than we think it is about mm -hmm. um, people missing pe missing school because of their periods, which again, so annoying, need education yeah. um, and practical support. Um, I have an inkling that I feel like it's the top one too. <laughs> that would be fair if you copied Jason to be fair after the last round. So. <laughs> <laughs> I did think of it beforehand, but I wasn't allowed to speak. <laughs> <laughs> let's um, uh, let's yeah. find out oh so the second one is oh. the 12 percent of people who have periods report their period pains are so severe they have to miss work or school it's actually between 32 and 40 percent which is very high but unsurprising yeah so, nice <laughs> fake fact number three only 70% of women went for a cervical screening in 2020-2021. Nearly 50% of women will switch their contraceptive method in the first year due to side effects. Only 40% of women attend their breast screening appointments in 2021-2022. Lots of facts and figures here. What are our initial thoughts? My initial thought is the top one's fake. I feel like it's lower how many women actually go to have their cervical screening, which is very sad. Mm. I, I thought it was closer to 50%, but hopefully I'm wrong. And it is. And it is <laughs> <Higher> yeah. <than laughs> that. Hopefully that is the case. What about you, Jason? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, both of the screenings seem... I would have expected maybe I would have thought maybe they were lower because it's obviously not a fun process at all. Um, maybe the first I think I think you might have a, the first one. It's only seventy percent, like you'd expect only for a number that was a bit lower. So I think um, I'm wondering as I actually I haven't seen the answer to this, but I'm wondering if there's a spanner in the works here because the first and third fact are COVID years. I wonder if that's swaying the number of people who went to their screenings. Mm. I don't know. I'm just playing devil's avocado here. So <laughs> let's find out. <laughs> we will find out. Only 40% oh. of women attended their breast screening appointment in 2021, 2022. It was actually 62% of women, which is a good fake fact, I suppose. I mean, wow. it's it's better, but it could be even better than it that. Could be so better. I'm happy yeah. to be proved wrong on that one. I feel yeah. like I was being too cynical. I feel like that kind of <laughs> proves the power of, um, you know, missions like Bloody Good Period, because like we've been hammered with cervical screening reminders social media tv ads over the years and now as a result lots of people uptake it more breast screening you don't see as much you know you know it happens but you don't really get sort of the same kind of in your face you should do this why is it good so maybe that's why it's yeah, true maybe that's breast true. screening needs to come back you, you touch on that a lot as well when it comes to not pushing this as a hygiene thing but pushing it as a health mm. thing as well don't you it, it, it makes it much more serious when you talk about it in that respect mm -hmm. and this is kind of proof of that backs that up I think for us as well it's really important not to use the words like hygiene or sanitary mm -hmm. because periods are not dirty 
Yeah. And I feel like those words really reinforce those shame and stigma and myths about periods being dirty and like they need to be hidden and something really unnatural is happening to your body, which is not the case at all. It's very natural process for the body. So for us, it will always be menstrual health and not menstrual hygiene. And it will always be period products, not sanitary products, mm -hmm. because periods are not dirty and they should not be shamed. Absolutely. I like it. Right. I don't know if there's another fake fact. There is. Aha. Uh -huh. um, what, so, what is our score? Is it we're equal, aren't we? One I think, one each. I think you're yeah, one all, one all. Yeah. <laughs> so eight percent of British people that have periods are affected by period poverty. A quarter of people who have periods have experienced negative comments about their period. And 84% of people in the UK said they have given a period product to a friend, a family member, or a stranger in need. divisive we are still here listeners. <laughs> um, what do you think on I, the period poverty one heather i feel like you're most i think it's higher person. i think mm. it's higher i do feel like that's a fake one but again maybe i just keep getting caught out and my brain is just like there's so many <laughs> numbers coming up my head <laughs> <laughs> what do you think jason i think that more people have experienced negative comments about their period but that's a perception thing isn't it like there's like, like you could be you could you could think that it's not about your period but actually it was caused by that because you were you know if, if someone's not making space for you to talk about it at work and then someone says oh you've mm -hmm. been a bit unhappy lately that that might not be directly perceived as related to it but it is because you just you're not allowed to talk about the reasons for why you're down at that moment so I think it's higher but that depends on if their awareness is there, perhaps. Yeah, I think that maybe more people have experienced negative comments about their period. Okay. Locking in the answers. Are you going with one Heather yeah. and two Jason? I think. <laughs> Number there one is correct. Um, so 8% of pe British people that have periods are affected by period poverty. It's actually 12%. So not a happy stat to end on, but... Um, Heather, we will declare you the winner of, of Fake Facts. Congratulations. <laughs> you have out-perioded Jason. <laughs> Which uh, brings us nicely on to our third and final section. Jason, as a commiseration prize, you could introduce this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what we normally do is at the end we play a strategy analogy <clears throat> where we, we pick a word from a random word generator and just try and nicely summarise the conversation that we've, that we've had today. Uh, I haven't prepared. Sorry, let me just load up the generator, <laughs> not a number generator, a uh, word generator. So, uh, yeah, so let's go with the first word that this loads. Uh, it's going to be a noun. Actually, it doesn't get any of them. It's Q, as in Q U E U U E, -U -E, -U -E you know, as in lining up. <laughs> a Q, <laughs> yeah. lining up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> An analogy. Um, to do with queuing well who better to ask than three people in the uk i suppose oh that's <laughs> true we do love a queue <laughs> i suppose be... no go on hello go on i was just going to say it would be me queued up lobbying for free period products <laughs> yeah that was where i was going to go as well that there's there's a queue that is far too long of people in need yes. of uh, period Thank products you. in the uk and so we should do a mad dash to the bar of period products instead of queuing. <laughs> yeah. Swarm them. <laughs> and by them, I mean Parliament. <laughs> Jason's trying to think of a, a period analogy as someone who does not have periods. <laughs> well, there might, there might be an opportunity for education in this. I think you just go, yeah, just spitball it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think <laughs> I literally don't have the end of the sentence as I start it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it's about time. I know queuing is roughly related to waiting your turn. Um, and it's about time that, you know, 50% plus of the population was, um, well, listened to when it comes to this and given a chance to. Like, it doesn't just affect, as you've said, Heather, it doesn't just affect them, it affects every environment they're in they just the, the voices are kind of quietened and the conversation is tabooed 
Um, and yeah, it's absolutely time for this to be top of the agenda. Um, there's so many things that everyone's worried about, cost of living, as you said, there's, a, there's lots of things that people have issues with, there's lots of marginalised groups, but this affects so many people that it's crazy that it's not like talked about more. Um, yeah, that's that's my attempt at summarising a little bit with Q. I very roughly. I think that was a really good word. word. Yeah, I think that was a really good word. <laughs> yeah, it Thank is. You. It's about bloody time. It is about yeah. bloody time. I think on that note, it's the perfect note to round up. Heather, is there anything else you'd like to add? Any plugs you'd like to make that you haven't already? Um, follow our socials. Bloody good periods. Sit in the name. Um, We've got a comedy night coming up in September. Early bird tickets are available now. We have a really amazing lineup. So if you fancy doing that, it's in London, then that would be amazing. We would very much love to see you there. Brilliant. And uh, for the listeners, we will link everything in our show notes to everything that Heather's talked about today. Um, thank you very much for your time, Heather. It's been lovely having you on. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been really great. 